So a couple weeks ago, I spoke to you guys about um, manna. Talked to you about how the Israelites had complained about manna, how we get bored with God. And we get bored with the things of God sometimes, and we begin to complain. And God actually had this, right after he gave me that one, he gave me this one. So this is kind of the second part of that that kind of goes with it. Um, if you want to go to Numbers chapter 21, we're going to read from there. The Israelites had left Egypt. Um, God had delivered them from slavery. And you guys, this wasn't something where they were servants. They were slaves. Um, they were beaten if they didn't work fast enough. They were not in a good place in Egypt. And um, all sorts of horrible things were happening to them. And so they'd been delivered. They cried out for deliverance. And they were delivered. God took them into the wilderness. He provided for them. He gave them manna. He gave them... No, they weren't. Maybe they weren't comfortable because, of course, they were in the wilderness and they were having to walk through deserts and over plains and up mountains and all sorts of stuff. But they also stayed there a lot longer than they had to because if you go and look at it, they really could have made it through a lot faster. God took them through in a circle for 40 years because of their mouth, because of their hearts. He couldn't get them to line up with him. So he had to wait for, uh, because of a generation that sinned, he had to wait for that generation to weed themselves out till the new generation came in. And God was reminding me of something about the new generation. A lot of times we see two generations in church. We see the older and we see the younger. And the younger people are like, okay, but this isn't my style. The older people are like, this is the way I want it. And so there's this battle that goes on between the two generations. Now, there was the same battle in the wilderness. And they had the exact same problem. In fact, they had the same problem because God called them to go take over the promised land, and there was 12 spies sent out. Ten of them were older men, came back and told Moses, we can't do it. But it was the two young people. That said, yeah, we can. You may not like the next generation coming up, but the next generation will probably have more faith than you do because they're not as cynical. We often get very cynical with our age. Watch your heart. You can guard your heart and keep yourself from being cynical and guard your mouth because it will bite you back. So let's go to Numbers 21, verse 1. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Ephraim, the route that was traveled by the spies that were sent out by Moses, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And the name of the place was called Horma. It means a band or a devoted thing. And they traveled from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, depressed, and much discouraged because of the trials of the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Now, hold on a second. I want to stop right there. They just had a great victory. Said, God, if you do this, we'll do this. Had a great victory, had great breakthrough, and what happened? Then they got depressed and got discouraged because of the trials that were in their way. And then they began to speak against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? We're still on that old argument. Do you catch that, how old this argument is? Now, they, they argued the same argument with the manna. Remember chapters before? They're still using the same argument because they can't get off of it. You guys, if your argument is 20 years old, it's time to grow up. Their argument is 40 years old. Yeah. Do you understand that? If you had just left us in Egypt, I really, this is, this is why I'm not God. Because I would look down and be like, shut up. It's old. Let it go. Let it go. 
Ready? Go! Okay. Really? <laughs> Come on! You're not in Egypt. Just get over it. And I'm so sick of it. Like, really? Come on, people. But we are the same way. When a complaint comes up, up in us, we will bring up things that should have died a long time ago. Why? And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why, Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You have manna. It's good enough for angels, but it ain't good enough for you. Mm. Neither is there any water, and we loathe this light and contemptible, unsubstantial manna. We loathe it. They'd gotten to the place where they hated the provision of God. Ouch. I want you to catch the attitude here. God, but you gave us this, and I don't like it. This is, this is oh, my goodness. Ain't good enough. This is the same complaint Adam made, the woman you gave me. Yeah. And then the Lord. Now, I, I do have to say, me, I'm, I don't know if I would have done it this way, but I have to say, the, it's about time that God reacted. Because they deserve this fun. And often we don't like the fact God does, re, he does react to us, you guys. There is a point he says, enough. So if you want to know what God did, here you go. The Lord sent fiery, burning serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many Israelites died. Now remember another time they complained and sinned and the ground opened up and ate them. God, you know, God only put up with so much. He does get to a point where he says enough. We think, well, yeah, but we're in the New Testament. We God's got we got grace, Ananias and Sapphira. Do we remember them? Who lied to the Holy Spirit and then just dropped dead? How long will God put up with your lies? And how long will he put up with our attitudes? There, he does have a line, you guys, just like a parent. You can only push him so far. He does have, he has patience, but yet he does have a left hand. And there is judgment there. There is a moment where he says, enough. Sometimes the worst thing is, and we don't realize this, the worst thing he could ever do is back away from you. And leave you to yourself. Do you realize the greatest that when 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 David sinned, his greatest fear was the presence of God leaving him. That's why he said, "Clean my heart, God. Deal with me. Please don't let your presence leave me." The greatest fear was, "God, don't let your presence leave me." Wow. But God will deal. So he sent these fiery serpents, they bit people, and then Moses intercedes and prays for the people. He was their intercessor. That's Jesus. He's the intercessor. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent of bronze and set it on a pole, and everyone that is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and if, a ser if the serpent had bitten any man, when he looked to the serpent of bronze, Attentively and expectantly, with a steady and absorbing gaze, he lived. He lived. Now, this is really interesting because this is a type of Christ. This is Jesus put up on a cross for us. The key here is, yes, they were bitten. And I'll tell you something. Complaining bites. It bites. Complaining never starts with just one complaint. It always comes to something else. The minute you open your mouth and begin to complain about one thing, you're going to find a flood of other things you're going to complain about. It never starts with just one. Never. It always spreads and becomes multiple. And the key here is to look to the cross. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. First of all, do we have a critical heart? This is something to ask yourself. Because... You know, there's nothing like a critical heart. You can try to please somebody, but if they have a critical spirit where they have allowed themselves over years to complain, 
they have already gotten bit by the serpent. And it burns in their soul. They can't get rid of it. It's um, another way to put it would be someone who has a spirit of strife. They love to start arguments. They love to begin little tiffs with everybody. They always have a contention with someone. Have you ever worked with someone like that? Mm -hmm. They always have an issue. If you're like that, you need to deal with yourself. Well, I'm not like that. It's just because everyone else just drives me nuts. Person, you need to get on your knees and seriously deal with your two. It's, it's really hard to deal with people like that. It really is. It's hard to work in any kind of situation with anyone. Whether it's out in the world or here in a ministry, it's just hard. It's, hot. it's hard to live with. The Word talks about living with a contentious person. is like a constant drip. Well, it's just as much of a constant drip if it's a contentious man, too. That's why I said a person. It goes both ways. You know, a lot of times men are like, oh, I just wanted, yeah, if it was just the wife. Well, what about you? It's, it's horrible to live with a contentious child. Put it in light of anybody. It's not, no one wants to live with that. We should be grateful. Jesus has done so much for us that Thanksgiving should come out of us. Gratefulness should be something that comes out of us, not complaining. And if you wake up in the morning and all you can think about is everything to complain about, you need to work on your mind. Because what you're focused on isn't what you should be focused on. Because it's affecting your heart. You know, and I'll tell you, to have a critical heart means you've got bitterness in there. And you know what bitterness will do? It'll rot your bones. You will be a rotten person on the inside and the out. Did you know that that kind of sin ages you? Bitterness will age you. Grace will keep you young. It will renew your youth like the eagles. But bitterness will <laughs> age you. Physically will age you. And it will also make you sick. It's one thing to pray for somebody. It's another thing when they've allowed an illness to come into their life because they're bitter. You have to go deal with your bitterness. These guys were bitter. They'd been walking through the desert for 40 years, and they're bitter. God was trying to get them to a better place, and it kept making them bitter. But that's because they were choosing the bitterness. Now, later on, you see Joshua and Caleb weren't bitter, though. They weren't like that at all. They were, like, ready to go. So you can choose to have a better attitude. And, you know, your attitude will make you or break you. It will sink your <coughs> ship or get you to the other side. It's your choice. Do we complain often and find fault with every little detail? I've said this before. Perfectionism is a lie. And it's a lie that if you let it bite you, you're going to have a really hard time with it. There's no such thing as absolutely perfection. It just doesn't happen. And this is this is probably my, and I was a perfectionist for a long time in a lot of ways, but this is still where I have my perfectionistic issue, is making cakes. I am a massive perfectionist when it comes to the frosting. Really bad. And that was because I had a trainer that was like that. So after the training, and she's even pickier than me, because if she doesn't like something, she will trash it and make another. I'm not that crazy because I'm like, I just made this. We're going to fix it somehow. So, I mean, I don't know. But sometimes I even look at Matt and go, help me. Because he did spackling. So, hey, why not? <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, just one's edible and one's not. So how do you fix this? And so we'll fix it. We'll stick a flower there. We'll stick a pearl in that spot. And then we'll fix whatever. But, you know, I had some weird stuff happen this week. And I was like, God, how do I fix this? I have to start over. Oh, and so we just really worked at it. It was hard. And it took a team effort for everybody to work on it. And then I was like, God, please help me not to complain about this cake because it stunk. It tasted good, but it didn't want to hold together and it was having issues. And But it was what was ordered and it wasn't my style and it wasn't what I liked. And I wanted, it wasn't my recipe, and I wanted to, comp 
complain and let my mouth loose. And God kept saying, it has to hold it back. Because once you open that gate, it flows to everything else. So I kept saying back, okay. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. And you know what? It turned out they liked it. Wasn't my thing. I wasn't really happy with it, but oh well. I didn't buy it. So it was it was one of those like let it go moments. And I kind of went, all right, Lord, but there's no point in letting my whole life and my whole day be ruined over something so not really that important. And we often do let the little things really get to us. Or somebody at work that just irritates the living snot out of us. So we go home and then we hand it to our spouse and complain all night about that person. Or, I mean, I, I've done it. And it's been done to me. And then you think, can we just like seriously move on? I'm not saying not to take it to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Ghost, I'm really irritated about this. But not everybody needs to hear the irritation. Take it to him, then give it to him. Learn to let some things just be and let God have them. That's what Pastor Daniel was saying. To put them in the hands of God and let God have it. Versus complaining over it consistently. Constantly making sure everyone heard you. Sometimes what you feel is so important to you, it's really not important to everyone else or the whole we so often want what we think is important. But, you know, decisions do have to be made for a whole group of people sometimes. I, I know I see Glenn and my dad and different people, men that have been in leaders of groups. You guys have to make a decision for the whole very often that an individual could get upset about. Moses had to make a, a decision for the whole that often the individual didn't like. That's where the complaining came in. But what needed to happen was one person look at the other one and say, knock it off. This decision is being made for the whole of us. You don't like it? There's a desert walk back. There is a point where we have to stop the mouth of the person next to us when they want to complain about, well, I don't like this. Did you see? I didn't like the leadership doing this. I don't like you go to work. I don't like our boss and how he makes these decisions. You know, I want to look at people and say, do you really want his job? Seriously. You really want to answer to all those people. You really want to deal with all of this stress that they deal with. Sometimes we just need to get off our high horse. Deal with just what we have in front of us. You, trust me, you don't want to deal with it. Do we easily get discouraged after a great triumph and then get discouraged and start complaining? This is something to check your heart on because it's easy to do. You can have very, very high highs, and where is there to go after a high high? And often people hit a valley somewhere. Now, the word says we're supposed to go from glory to glory, but... You know, the truth is, often we do come down the mountain a little bit. But you got to be careful you don't end up in the valley and you're swimming in grief after a mountaintop experience. We have to choose. Criticizing and complaining is different from troubleshooting an issue. Often people think, well, I don't want to complain, so I'm just not going to say anything. That's, that's not, that's different. Complaining is um, about focusing on a negative situation and making it negative. The other thing, and I'm going to tell you this too. Often, this is how you know you're criticizing something. If you're making an ultimatum. And I'm going to be teaching on this when we talk about the Made Whole series. Ultimatums are actually a bad way of communicating. And when I say bad, they're not healthy at all in communication. Because it's forcing someone else to, you're trying to actually control. If you don't do it like this, I'm walking out. If you don't do this, I'm doing this. God doesn't do ultimatums. He gives choices and steps back and lets us choose. Ultimatums are very unhealthy. And often they're bathed in criticism. I'm criticizing what I don't like in this situation or you. 
so I'm going to try and control it instead. That's not good. That's not God at all, because that's not what he's doing. That's not how he behaves. He always gives us blessing or cursing, life or death. He gives us choices. Remember, two choices, not 39. Two. His way or your way. Let me just say this. His way will always end up in blessing. And even though he may take you through, through a detour, it's his detour, which means it'll end up in the right place. Your detours, who knows where you're going to end up. That's why it's best to get his way, not your own. Complaining is about focusing on a negative. Correcting something is stating a fact and giving a plan to respond to it. Not dealing with conflict is not making peace, you guys. That's not, often we try to avoid the conversation. Why, as you know, if there's a situation in your marriage, the worst thing you can do is not directly deal with it. You know if there's an issue with your children, the worst thing you can do is try to ignore it and let it just go away because it's going to keep coming up. You're going to have to deal with it. It's the same way if you're at work. It's the same way in any relationship we deal with in, in our lives. You will just keep going around the mountain if you don't deal yep. with it. Yep. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's only what to do in the conflict. How to handle it. You can stay in peace even in a not peaceful situation. Because mm. peace is from Jesus. It's inside of you. But not dealing with some a conflict is not making peace. But it actually, avoiding it per, produces offenses and we let bitterness begin to fester. And when it comes to fruition, bitterness full-blown explodes like a volcano. It just goes everywhere, touches everybody. Having a critical complaining heart bites you. It stings back at you. Look at those serpents. They were fiery. When they bit those people, it burnt it burnt, it hurt, it was venomous. It's venomous to you. And it bites us and it poisons our lives and fills our, our lives with pain and torment. God never wanted us to be bitter people. He wanted us to be people that are thankful, full of forgiveness and mercy and kindness and the fruits of the Spirit, full of them. Complaining is not a godly thing. It's not a fruit, it's not a gift. It's actually from our sin nature. That's, it really is from our sin nature. You do not have to teach a child how to complain. You don't have to. Yeah, sure. The first time they begin to put sentences together, you'll hear this sentence. I'm bored. <laughs> Mom, I just don't know what to do. I don't like that. And they're bored. I don't like that. You know, different things. The, the kids, you don't have to teach a child to complain. It, it, you don't have to teach any adult to complain. It's it's in our sin nature, actually, to complain. You see it in the Bible. Nowhere did Moses say, now I'm going to take your complaints. He didn't have a box carried with on his camel for complaints. <laughs> he didn't have to teach them. He didn't even have to give them a complaint department. They made sure to complain. Yep. It's part of our sin nature. But if it's part of our sin nature, then what is the cure? The cure was that snake put up on that pole. And when they looked at it, they were healed. It's Jesus being lifted up in the sacrifice that he took on the cross. It's the sin nature dying at the crucifixion and going to the tomb and burying itself. When we put our sin nature aside, complaints die because they're intertwined. You can't be a complainer and have a sin nature that's crucified because it don't work. If you're complaining, your sin nature is running your life and it's supposed to be crucified. So that's something to think about. Who are you looking to? The cure is the cross. Whose sacrifice are we looking to? If Jesus yep. died on the cross, rose, rose again, gave me all that I need in my spiritual life and my physical life to be an overcomer in this world, what do I have to complain about? Really? Now, I'm not saying I don't get irked. I'm not saying that I don't get spiritually have to deal with some things or even see some things that are off like in our country 
or different things. I'm not saying there's not, honey, we got to deal with conflict. That's not what I'm saying. But when we begin to complain, and that's all that we do, once you begin that, open that door, like I said, it's like a serpent that comes in and bites you, and then the venom goes through your whole body. Because you begin to complain about everything. That's not what I want to do. I want to be thankful for the things that I have. God will deal with the things I don't have. Let's be grateful for what we do. Complaining can be very interesting when it comes to different types of things in our life. Go to Mark chapter 14. You know, sometimes we think, well, I wouldn't complain if I had really good leadership. Or, you know, if I had a really good boss. I wouldn't complain. If I had the right job, I wouldn't complain. Honey, be thankful you have a job. In our society, be thankful you have a house. Well, so some things falling apart. Now you have like, so deal with them. But complaining about them doesn't fix anything. If I took a board and sat it in front of me and then just yelled at it, does it fix the board? No. No. Well, it makes me feel better. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. It really affects your life. Deal with what you need to deal with. But complaining about it, there's no point. None. It just breeds it in us. It does. So when we begin to complain, now if you go to verse 1, it was now two days after the Passover, Mark 14, verse 1, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were all the while seeking to rush Jesus by secrecy and deceit put him to death for they kept saying it it must not be during the feast for fear that there might be a riot with the people and while he was in Bethany a guest in the house of Simon the leper as he was reclining at a table a woman came with an alabaster jar of ointment perfume of pure nard very costly and precious and she broke the jar and poured the perfume over his head but there were some who were moved with indignation and said to themselves, to what purpose was the ointment, perfume, thus wasted? In the book of John, he says it was Judas that says this. So Judas not only said this in his heart, he said it out loud. And his argument was, it's possible to have sold this perfume for more than 300 denarii, a man's laboring wages for a year, and to have given the money to the poor. I, I kind of laugh at this statement because, yeah, Judas really wanted to give it to the poor. Sure. He, he tried to look pretty self-righteous in his complaint here. Now, Judas didn't like what Jesus said because Jesus, Jesus said to leave her alone. Why are you troubling her? She's done a good thing and a beautiful thing to me. It's praiseworthy. It's noble. For you always had the poor with you whenever you wish that um, you could do something good with them. But you will not always have me. See, Jesus was saying that she cho chose the right thing at the right moment. Judas didn't like it. And so actually, after she's done and had done this, and she says it's, he says it's for my burial, um, in verse 10, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 apostles, went off to the chief priest in order to betray and hand him over. So Judas gets to a point where he begins to complain in his heart. See, it always begins in your heart, you guys. Before it ever comes out your mouth. It starts in the heart. It always starts there. And then he lets it out of his mouth. How he's frustrated with this. And then he goes and does his betrayal to hand Jesus over and to sell him. Now, I just have to say this. This man just said if this woman would go and do this and give it to the poor. If Judas was so concerned about the poor... What was he doing with the 30 pieces of silver? His heart was evil, and he had evil intentions, even though he tried to make it sound like he had good ones. Sometimes, you guys, when we try to complain about something, we try to make it look like we're, we're really doing the best thing. We're just we're bringing this to your attention. No, you're not. Because your intentions are not to fix anything. It's simply to complain because it's all about you. You know, Jesus actually proved the intentions of Judas's heart right here. It showed. 
Because if he really was concerned about the poor, then why would you betray Jesus? That has nothing to do with it. And if you're really concerned about the poor, then what, what are you doing with the 30 pieces of silver that were just handed to you? His complaints had no merit. And you guys, he had the best leadership. Judas had the best pastor, the best leader, the best teacher, the wisest best friend. And yet his heart never changed. Yep. You guys, we can have the best of the best. You can have the best boss in all the world and you can still have a rotten attitude. Uh-huh. And complain about everything. It is not them, it's you. Yep. I said this on Wednesday. When you hear a word, you need to be able to hear that word for yourself, not think about, oh, so-and-so needed this, and so-and-so needs to hear this because they need corrected in that area. Listen to a word and take it in for yourself. Ouch. Yep. Because God's trying to deal with us first. We often do that, and wives, I know, we do this with our husbands. Well, that's a good word. My husband needs to hear that. No, no that's a good word. You need to hear it. You need to take it in and apply it to your life. Yep. God will deal with your husband when you get out of the way. Ooh. Yeah. Those are words that God spoke directly at me standing in my kitchen. And when I got out of the way, he did. <laughs> because I got out of the way. Same thing with my kids. There are times God said, you're not their God, now back off. Oh, you're right. I'm just going to pray for them, and you're going to deal with them. Mm -hmm. You know, even with children, this is and this is tough. It's tough as a parent, you guys. To let your children have the consequences of their own behavior. To not feel like, oh, it's my fault, I did something wrong. Listen, they chose it. They chose this. And in the end, they have to deal with it. That's hard. It, that is hard. Because we so often try and take such control of things. You can only deal with one thing. Point your finger right at yourself. Me, myself, that's who I have to deal with, my attitude. Hebrews, the Hebrews, God had actually shown miracles to the Hebrews. Sometimes our complaint is, well, you know, I would know God is real, and I wouldn't buck him so much if I knew he, like, he did something big. Are you kidding me? The Hebrews walked through the wilderness, had a cloud by day to shade them, a fire by night to keep them warm, and they still couldn't believe him. They yeah. watched so many miracles happen, and they still had manna coming from the heavens every day to feed them. Yeah. When's the last time God fed you from the sky? <laughs> they still could not follow him and obey him simply. They kept using that same old argument, well, if you just left this back in Egypt, you'd be dead. <laughs> I wonder sometimes if God just went, I'm trying to keep you alive. But you won't quit. You know, it's like a kid, Mom, why do we have to eat this? Because I'm trying to keep you alive. Just stop, you know. But we buck, we really buck authority. And we buck someone else being sovereign because we want to rule our life. This is the humanism of our culture, you guys. I am in charge of my life and no one else. Yes, you are. But when the consequences come at the end of the age, you will stand alone. And no one else is to blame for what you did choose. Because we have a culture that just demands, I get to choose for me. You guys, God set up kingdoms and authority. He set them up. And if we buck all of that... We refuse to come under authority, especially his authority. What we sow is what we reap. Straight up. If you're not, if you go to work and buck on your boss all the time and treat him like dirt, honey, you're going to lose your job. That's a natural consequence of your behavior. Well, they shouldn't be able to do that. They just can't handle me. No, you need an attitude adjustment. And I've seen people like that. And then you wonder, how in the world are they going to survive in this life? That's just the point. They almost don't. They're barely making it through. And 
mostly because people just have feel sorry for them and have pity. That's dangerous too. Don't have pity on someone in their attitude. That, that's not healthy either. They've got to learn somehow. You know, Moses prayed for the people and he interceded for them and God had mercy on them. They didn't get better. They just kept getting better. Sometimes we think, well, God have mercy on us. I'd rather have God teach me than have mercy on me. Because mercy will kind of, a lot of times in my human nature, I will just end up in the back in the same situation over and over. Teach me wisdom. So then your mercy is already flowing in me. And I'm not begging for it every time. Help me to make good, healthy decisions and godly decisions so I don't end up needing, begging for mercy. Why wouldn't that be our prayer? Good. Instead of making the same Good. bad decisions over and over and over and asking for mercy. I'd rather make the right decision the first time. Have some wisdom. Hmm. Ephesians 4.29 is to let no foul, foul or uh, polluting language or evil word or worthless talk come out of your mouth but only the speech that is good and beneficial to spiritual progress of others, as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace and favor to those that hear it. It's not talking about you can't correct something, but do it with grace. Let no foul, don't sit and talk and call people names. Right. Even when you're dealing with a situation, right. when you're dealing with something, dealing with it in a negative way, you're going to produce negative things. If you come to your marriage and say, honey, we got to deal with this, and you blah, 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 and then you pour out this horrible, nasty, foul language, and then you expect a healthy response back? Really? That's right. Really? Yeah. Get a grip on your tongue. You know, I one of the things that I, I was not taught this in church, surprisingly. I was actually taught this in counseling when I was a foster parent. The best way to handle a conflicting situation as much as possible is not to use the words you. Because you will feel like the other person will always feel like they're being attacked. To say, I don't like this situation, or when this is said to me, this is how it makes me feel. To learn how to talk in a very gracious way that deals with it, but doesn't attack. And the word thing you don't do is name call and play games like that. And speak that way to people. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. To be happy in our faith. To rejoice and be glad-hearted continually and always. Be unceasing in prayer, praying perseveringly. Thank God in everything and thankful. Be thankful and give thanks. For this is the will of God for you, who are in Christ Jesus, the revealer and the mediator of that will. Philippians chapter 2, go there for a second, because there's quite a few verses here while you are flipping through. Unity. I want to talk to you a little bit about unity. The enemy of unity is complaining. The enemy of unity is strife. Right. And the minute we yeah. begin to complain, we buck up against unity. Now listen, unity is very powerful. I've taught on unity before. It actually was an old sermon from three or four years ago. Back when the church was this way, I think. When it was sideways this way. So, and I spoke about this unity. We hit, Unity has an enemy. And complaining and strife is the birth seat of it. And the minute you open those doors, it will fight. You'll, you'll lose the unity in your marriage. You'll lose the unity in your home. You'll use the, lose the unity at work. You'll lose the unity here in the body of Christ if you're complaining here. That's, you just lose it everywhere. And unity is powerful. United we stand, divided we fall. All for one and one for all. There's no I in team, we hear all these little statements. With it we stick and without it we're stuck. Unity is the most powerful weapon an army has, and it's yet it's the hardest to maintain. When they go across a bridge 
and they're in ranks. They actually break ranks and walk normal across a bridge because if a full platoon was to walk at march pace where they're together, because of the unity, they would make the bridge break. So they have to break walking across it because that's how much power there is in multiple steps of people in unity. There, it's not by happenstance that God calls us to be an army unified. See, they could have very easily, all those millions of Hebrews in the wilderness, uh -huh. if they had unified themselves, could have taken anything. That's right. Yep. Remember the Tower of Babel? They're building it, and they're all together, and God looks down and says, hmm, that's not a good thing. They're all together in unity, and they will accomplish it. So he had to come down and break up their languages because that's the only thing he could do. Because they were in unity in one accord. How did the Spirit of God fall in Acts 2? When they were in one accord. Uh -huh. The presence of God comes where two or three are gathered in unity. Yep. In one accord. So uh, unity is very powerful, but if we have our own agenda... And we're going to complain about everything, unity breaks. It's a breakable thing. It's like porcelain. You have to take care of it. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading this from the Passion Translation. Passion Translation, excuse me. So it's a little differently worded. I'm going to start in verse 1. I look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the Holy Anointed One. You are filled to overflowing with His comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection and mercy. So I'm asking you, my friends, that you be joined together in perfect unity with one heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together with one harmonious purpose that you will fill my heart with an unbounded joy. Be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts. But in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. And consider the example that Jesus, the Anointed One, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. Now, what example did Jesus set before us? I'm going to tell you what that example was. The Godhead, three in one. He, they completely function together in unity. They all have individual characteristics, individual jobs, individual giftings, and yet they're all three in one. And that one tries to trump the other one. One doesn't come in and go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I get half of this, or I get two thirds, you guys get the rest. That's not what they do. They are equal to each other, and they come in there, and yet they're very three distinct, and yet they completely function together. So Jesus had already given them an example of perfect unity and showed how three become one. You know, if your body, soul, and spirit, because you are that kind of a being, we're made in God's image, we have a three-part being in us, a body, a mind, a soul, and our emotions, and our spirit man. And if you're at battle with yourself, you're going to be kind of off. If you're, I've met a few people like that. You can tell they're just not, their mind and their spirit and everything, it's all off because they're not working together. God wants us whole in our bodies. That's Jesus. He gave, brought us healing and wholeness, right? But he also came to heal our minds, our hearts, our, our emotions. And our spirit man is saved and delivered and is supposed to our flesh our sin nature is supposed to be crucified at the cross so when those things come into line we become a stable person and what does james say an unstable person is unstable in all their ways a double-minded man if you if your mind and your spirit man and your body is all fighting each other you're you're a double-minded you're not together you're not in unity so first we got to unify ourselves then we got to unify ourselves with Christ because he's the head of each of us. 
And then we have to unify ourselves in the body, but we also, that always starts at home first. Ooh, yeah, it does. I'm going to teach you something about the church. A little bit of teaching for a minute. It doesn't start here. You're only here for a couple hours a week. This is a place you get equipped, but the place that we live, where we spend our time at home with our families, or work in the place that we're out and spending the most time, that's the place where we are the church. That's the place where we have to work on us. Am I in unity with the Spirit of God? Am I in unity with what Jesus is wanting in my life? Mm -hmm. Am I in unity with my spouse and my children? You mean my, your kids can be in unity with you? Yeah. Start with your marriage first. Well, start with God first, then your marriage. Yep. And your kids will slowly begin to follow that. They will. Because they're simply a product of what they're already watching. They are. So it will come. That's how we live out coming in unity. And we have to be very careful because unity has an enemy. It has an enemy, you guys. Know your enemy. Remember, we talked about that a few different times. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation that you're called with, with all loneliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, even as you're all called in the hope of your calling. Endeavor, it means work. You guys listen, to stay in unity with your spouse, to stay in unity with God, to stay in unity in the body believers meeting, to stay in unity at your work, to stay in unity with your children. It's a process and it's going to require you to work at it. Because yep. there's going to be times you're going to want to say something. But just remember, when you say something, there's something that bites you and it comes back and it bites you. Complaining bites. You open a gate. When we start, I'm just venting. I have a friend and I go and I vent. Are you fixing anything or are you just complaining? It's one thing to fix something, you guys. It's another thing just to complain. There, there really is a difference. And you have to ask yourself, where's my heart? Am I causing disunity with my mouth? Because they weren't helping the unity when they started fighting and screaming, just take us back to Egypt. That didn't help anybody stay in unity. That just kept reminding them where they've come from. I'll tell you, one of our issues in this nation is that we have a very hard time seeing past our own rights and our own opinions. We are very opinionated people. Oh, and social yeah. media has yeah. made that even ten times bigger. Worse. Social media can be a good thing, and there is such an evil to it at the same time. Yep. We have to be very, very careful. We can get very opinionated on there and make it all about us. Really, we could say, "Well, this is what what God is saying, maybe to you, but that doesn't mean it's to the rest of the world." And sometimes we don't need to air it. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, we need just right. to hang on to it and correct ourselves and deal with ourselves. There's an attitude of entitlement that has crept in from the world, and it actually has come into the church. Well, and I've said this before, you know, some people kind of look at, I don't like your carpet, it's ugly. Or they don't like this. So I heard somebody one time say, this is just too much wood for me. I'd just rather everything be drywall. Well, wham. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, what are we going to do? We ain't fixing it for you. It is what it is. Deal with it. This isn't your house and nobody lives here. But God, we come here and visit. So yeah, it may not be your taste, but who said it has to be your taste? You don't go to a hospital and go, hmm, this isn't really my taste, so you need to remodel everything so it suits me when I come to visit here. They're gonna look at you and go, there's the door. <laughs> we are so self-opinionated. You walk into a doctor's office. Well, I may not choose to come to this doctor because I don't like his office. Really? 
it's, I thought it was about the doctor that you needed for the situation. You may not like the office. Oh, well. We had to take John down that big old ramp down the dental clinic when they used to, now that they got the new building, oh, hallelujah. They built that building for us, you know, I'm telling you. Anyway, we had to take his wheelchair. So I'm in the back holding John back, Matt and Alana. It took all three of us to get his wheelchair down that ramp so we wouldn't kill each other or him because it was such a steep ramp. Somebody's out front and they're kind of keeping his knees, they're hanging onto his knees and scooting him down and two of us are hanging on the back. It was just ridiculous. So finally they did, you know, they got a different building. I used to say, boy, this ramp is work. And then getting him up the ramp. <laughs> when we were done, just going to the dentist was like, we get home and we're like, can we go back to bed? We're so done. <laughs> it was exhausting. But I thought, you know, they're not going to change the building for us. I know it wasn't just for us. But I'm so grateful they did, <laughs> eventually. But we, that's where we had to go, whether we liked the ramp or not. We just had to go. Mm -hmm. Had to put your big girl panties on kind of thing, you know, and deal with it. It's part of life, you guys. You're going to deal with things that you don't like. Where do we come where we're just going to be very adult about it? Are we going to still act like we're in kindergarten and throw a fit and lay on the floor? Our society has such an emphasis on our individual rights that it forgets about the rights of the whole. And that has come into the church. Well, I don't like this and I don't like that. And that's not my style and that's not my way. But where is God leading us and what is he doing? Well, I don't like manna. It's not really my taste, and God should taste, change the taste for us. Really? Did you see how when they did take it to God and complain, <laughs> he didn't handle that very well. At some point, God got annoyed with their complaints, <laughs> and he let their complaints bite them. He let them pay for it. Uh, we just get so picky. We like our 39 flavors of ketchup. Really, you guys? Why? I, I literally have looked at the ingredients, you know, because we used to do, I'm in the store and I'm trying to put all these ketchups up. And I'm looking at the ingredients going, they're the same thing. You just like this brand because it's a little thicker. Or maybe they grew their tomatoes near coffee and it has a little bit of a taste or I don't know we are just so picky what's with us and as you know sometimes the church adapts this belief and then we get all out whack because I don't like being on a whack I can feel it when I'm off do you know what I mean where you're not feeling quite balanced and you're like God what is with me like oh we need to correct ourselves before we completely go crazy. I believe individuals' needs need to be met, but sometimes there's a moment where you have to meet the need of the whole, like a family. We used to, when our kids were younger and we had such a large family, we had to have family meetings regularly. Now that I just have two kids at home, I go and talk to a more individual. Once in a blue moon, we have a family meeting and have to really talk about something all together. But when I had nine kids, nine different conversations isn't really a good idea. Nine individual conversations isn't really great to have. What I needed to do was talk to everybody at the same time. So everybody was on the same page. If you as a boss can't get all your people in a room together to talk, there's a problem. So, And it's the same way. If we can't get together and actually talk to each other, with respect and understanding, then we have an issue. Because we, we should have a unified goal, even as a church or as a family. We should have a unified goal as the whole. So we have to be careful. We have to protect unity and be very, very careful with strife. Strife is a, a demon, I'm telling you it is. It's a spirit. It is on some people. They love to just start stuff. You ever been around that? I've had people come in my home and it was on them. And I've learned to pray now before they come. 
Father, I thank you that any spirit, it's, it, it's not allowed in my house. They're not bringing fights in here. They're not bringing arguments. Their strife stays with them, but it is not allowed in my house. So go sit in their car, but you ain't coming in this house because I want unity. Unity becomes a problem because we often get out of line and we, we get a little upset about things that are really important to us, but we forget that we're supposed to protect unity. We need to protect the unity of the brother. We need to protect the unity in our home. Protect it. Be careful with it. That's kind of like your heart is protected by your rib cage. Oh, that's good. Your heart is the lifeline. Your brain will die if your heart's not functioning. That's true. And the heart is the lifeline of you. It's the center of everything. And it is protected by your ribs. So think of it this way. If you don't protect unity, if we don't protect it in our personal lives and here in, in church and in our jobs and stuff, you might as well just, you're unprotecting the heart. It's going to be exposed to something. And it's going to take it out. Know your enemy. Unity has an enemy. I've mentioned this. It's strife. Contentions, opinions, jealousy, judgment, pride, insecurity. Do you know insecurity produces pride? Because we can be very insecure and hurt and have a wound that we never let Jesus heal. And then what happens is we think we have to protect ourselves and our wounds. So then we build up a pride wall. And what we don't realize is that pride is actually harming you even more than the insecurity is. Because if you would let Jesus deal with the insecurity, you'd be whole. But if you keep the pride up, you're actually keeping God from being able to function with you. Because the Bible says he resists the proud. That means he stands up against the proud and says you can't go any further. That's good. He actually does that for our own benefit. Did you know it? Because if we function through this life completely in proud pride, and he lets us go any further, we'll actually damage things. Ooh, yeah. Not just ourselves, but other people. So it, he does it out of love. But if you'll deal with the insecurity, the pride will come down. But you got to get past the pride to deal with the insecurity. Fear. Often we do things in fear. Well, that's just, I just can't handle this. This is not the way I like it. Or since just, I can't, I can't. You guys, we're not supposed to have that kind of spirit. This is about God and relinquishing control to him. Letting him be sovereign. Fear. We're not to be in fear. 365 promises of do not fear. One for every day of the week is in the word. Selfishness. It's going to be my way or no way. That's what an ultimatum is. It's bathed in selfishness. My way or the highway. In our attitude, I, I preached a message to the youth years ago when I was ministering to teenagers. And it was, um, are you a skunk? And we talked about the stinky attitudes that we sometimes have. You don't have to get very close to a skunk to know it's in the premises. Have you ever walked in a room and people had an attitude and you could smell it in the air? You could feel it. In the atmosphere, that's that attitude, and it stinks. Those are enemies of unity, and they will begin often with complaints. We are the ones who have to guard our hearts and take our attitudes to the cross, just like they took, had to look up at the cross with the serpent on it. The picture of Jesus that Jesus became sin for us. He became it. That's the picture of the cross. They had to look at it in order to be healed. If you want healed of a complaining nature, a critical heart, insecurity, fear, anything in our life, the key is to look to the cross. The key is to look to Jesus Christ, the one who sacrificed everything to set us free from that sin nature. Because that's where it comes from. I'm going to invite you guys to stand with me today.
I'm going to do something a little different. I want you to put your hand in your heart for a second. Left, right hand, don't matter. We're not pledging allegiance or anything. I'm going to pray, and I want you guys to pray with me. And we're going to pray over ourselves. Only God and the Holy Spirit can correct us, you guys. We have to take correction of our own life. Father, in Jesus' name, correct my heart. Correct my mouth. And help me. If there's any strife, any complaining, any fear, any insecurity, any pride, any jealousy, anything in me that stops me from being in unity with you, with my spouse, with my kids, with the church, at work, or anybody. Correct me, Holy Spirit. Show me. Weed it out of me. Help me to look to the cross to understand that my sin nature is dead. And I'm not going to live like that. I want to live from the fruits of the Spirit. In Jesus' name.